Welcome, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of the Think Lobo podcast. I'm your host, International Seth, and today's date is February 14th, 2021. Happy Valentine's Day, I guess, whatever that means. Anyhow, we have an exciting show on today, and make sure that you go subscribe to this channel to get more information and more uh, uh, videos and information with our awesome guests like we have on today. I first met this man, I believe, in 2006, and I remember vividly because I was in Atlanta, and he came and scooped me up in a nice dark green Jaguar, and we started driving around to greater Atlanta, and we saw lots of real estate development projects that he was involved in. So we, I, was, I was in awe because I never saw you know, real estate like, like how it was in Atlanta back in the early, the mid-2000s. Uh, afterwards, we went ahead and grabbed some food at his own restaurant. We got some nice fish and some French fries and stuff we threw down. And again, it was inspirational because I'd never seen ownership like this before, walking into your own restaurant and eating some food. So I would like to thank him for his inspiration that he provided me and welcome Mr. Walid Samsadeen onto the Think Global podcast. Welcome, Walid. Brother Yusuf, it's my pleasure. I appreciate the invitation. So excited to be here, excited to reconnect. I'm inspired by what you're doing, and I'm just hoping I can share some things that will make a difference on your platform. Definitely, definitely. I tell my audience right now, you better get your pen and paper ready because my man Wally has a really, really high business acumen, especially when it comes to business and real estate. So you might want to take down some pointers. Anyhow, Wally, we have a segment on this show where we provide all our guests with 10 seconds to name off some of the country that you've been to. So right now we're going to put Wally Samsadine on the world call. Ready? Go. <laughs> Botswana, Ethiopia, Tanzania, Qatar, Dubai, Abu Dhabi, Singapore, Amsterdam, U.S., uh, Turks and Caicos, just to name a few. Over 40 countries around the world, man. Wow. I consider myself to be a global citizen. A globetrotter, <laughs> a globetrotter. Over 40, yeah, yeah, man. That's amazing, man. So you met, I mean, and I heard a lot of variety. You tried off Africa, the Middle East, and Asia, some small islands and everything like that. So credit to you, man. And I'm glad to see that you're safe and healthy. So you are the owner of Supreme Foods. Uh, right there. I know everybody in Atlanta already know uh, all about Supreme Food and the type of quality um, products that you provide. You want to just talk a little bit about your, your company, how many locations you have and where you guys are Awesome. At? We have 11 locations, brother, 11 locations in Atlanta. Uh, nine of them are Supreme Fish Delights, where we have a seafood gourmet. Uh, and then the other one is a Supreme Burger, where we have gourmet burgers. And then we also have a couple of kiosks in some arenas. We've been in business now over 40 years, second generation owner, few hundred employees, and, and our intent is to really serve, provide great quality food, you know, in a, in a clean and fun environment, and really give back to the community. So we're really excited to be celebrating 40 years in business and continuing to provide food service. Uh, we also launched a, a nonprofit that deals with food insecurity, and we most recently, because of COVID, did a Meals on Wheels program to push meals out to the homes of our senior citizens and our youth. So just really excited about what we're doing in the Atlanta market. Man, congratulations to that, man, and uh, keep up the good work there. Uh, you talked about COVID, and there's this whole thing about the new economy, right? And, of course, restaurants were, were really impacted by COVID as far as being locked down and limiting the capacity with the restrictions. Um, how have you guys been affected, and how have you kind of made adjustments in this, um, this these challenges that we're all facing? Well, to, to be honest, is uh, COVID has been challenging, but it's also been a blessing. You know, in America, uh, the government released about $3 trillion in support of small businesses uh, through the CARES Act. And we've been able to leverage that CARES Act. That's probably one of the largest transfers of wealth in the past hundred years in the U.S. So because we're in business as a, as a nonprofit, uh, we're in business as a for-profit, we have multiple uh, streams of revenue we were able to pivot and take advantage of some of these government programs, these government grants, some foundations, and then still push to increase our sales in the restaurant. So while everybody else was closing and cutting back, we've actually been growing and expanding. We've been hiring new people, looking for new opportunities to open up restaurants, both domestically and in some other marketplaces. We're looking at Canada now, and we're looking at Mexico to expand during this COVID scenario, this COVID situation. 
Wow, that's amazing. I mean, <laughs> wow, that's amazing, amazing. So you're growing during COVID. How has like maybe some of the actual, the physical attributes of the, the restaurants, has anything closer to create se separation between the next table or have you guys had to have some kind of automation with like orders or anything like that? Oh my God, use of all of that, brother, all of that. Because uh, the CDC is right in Atlanta, they uh, issued government regulations as it relates to restaurant. We had to bring in plexiglass, PPE equipment, mask and hand sanitizers. We have to clean the restaurants every hour. We do curbside, online ordering, uh, non-touch policies. Even our delivery vehicles, when we're making deliveries, we sanitize the, the vehicles. We sell all the meals to wear gloves and face masks. The whole program uh, in terms of policies and procedures had to be developed for PPE. So that transition took place around March or April of last year. And now we have systems in place to support, to make sure we're being health conscious as we're in the food service space with our, with our consumers. So absolutely. Yeah, so I mean, this this whole thing is 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 very changing rapidly. Technology is becoming more, you know, of a of a crutch to the, the the economy as well. Um, but I've seen a lot of people like they're saying right now. I'm outside the U.S. You know, I'm in Qatar, so I'm just like reading articles. I'm trying to fill in the dots. But they're saying a lot of people are moving out of the Northwest and California. So the re new real estate trends. I know real estate is something that you're also really into as well. Um, are changing and the dynamics are changing rapidly. I I heard uh, one a run article reported was said that 5,000 people per week were um, relocating to the, the state of Florida. And they're saying it was about U-Haul and how about <laughs> how all the U-Hauls are like stuck down in Florida and they need to get to get the U-Hauls out of there. So I know you're right there in, in Atlanta, yeah. Georgia, but there's an influx of uh, people coming to uh, uh, Georgia. Can you, can you talk about a little bit about the, the real estate market? Yeah, well, I'm going to tell you, these produce unique opportunities in real estate. Uh, it's definitely a rental's mark now. If you own real estate or in a position to acquire real estate, now is the time. You would be surprised in the last year uh, during COVID, a lot of people lost jobs. Unemployment rate was up to like 30 percent. And you look at that, that creates opportunity to invest, to buy, to give back, to support. And, and really, the wealthier became even more wealthy during COVID, another trillion dollars went into the hands of wealthy Americans because you have to you have to understand when when there's disaster, when there are challenges, if you can solve problems, that's a unique opportunity to create wealth during recessions, during depressions, during pandemics. And believe me, you know, people are not not really taking advantage of it, but but exploring those opportunities. We were fortunate enough to get in Mills on Wheels, but look at other people, uh, Amazon, for example. Everybody is delivering, you know, UPS, DHL, everything is being brought right to your home. Um, so it, it, it's just a matter of looking at the real estate market now and looking at these opportunities to buy real estate in places where the real estate is depressed and also look at government programs that would tie in for job creation and stimulating economies that are depressed. So it's really about where you are and what opportunities you can take advantage of during a global pandemic. Mm, 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 mm. Would you just another question in regards? Would you say that Atlanta is is well? I know there's always opportunities with sparsely within, but you say in general right. is Atlanta more at the high end of you know the real estate boom, or is it still has a lot lot to go? Would, would you how would you gauge? Is it it's on the it's, it's a growing. We're, we're in the South. It's not like uh, New York or or California, you know, or Washington State or D.C where the market is, is, the, is very expensive. The cost of living is very high. Real estate is very expensive. We're in the South. There's still a lot of room for growth and development. Atlanta is a city, but it's a smaller city in comparison to those big markets. So you can come to Atlanta and live on a third or 50% or of what you would need to live in California or New York. It's real opportunities there for growth and development, not only in residential, but also commercial. Dallas is a huge market. Charlotte is a huge market. There's still several markets in Florida, Sarasota, Miami, Jacksonville, where you can really live comfortable, you know, coming out of a New York or coming out of a L.A. where you're accustomed to spending so much for your quality of life. Not to mention global markets. You know, it's nothing like uh, uh, Singapore or Dubai. The cost of living is much higher. You know, if you're making your money in Dubai and living in the States, you, that money can go a long way. Same yeah. for Nigeria. You know, it's millionaires and billionaires in Nigeria offer of the oil and gas money. They can come to the States and live quite well. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can vouch for that, man. The cost of living out here in Qatar is, is through the roof, but luckily it's compensated by, you know, higher salaries as well. All right, yeah. so we're going to make a little pivot, and we're going to discuss um, a little bit about your history with um, uh, Drumline, the live tour that you guys did in Asia. I, I know that uh, you, you, were, you were in the background, you were producing that. So you want to talk about the, like the, the mission of that project and like what couple, couple of countries that you guys went on the tour? Because this is a Think Global here. We're all around the world, so we're going to be jumping back and forth. So right now we're going yeah. to take us to Asia, right? Yeah, so Drumline was founded by my partner, Don P. Roberts. He's a, a band director, musician, producer, uh, e- executive producer, just very talented, b- based here in uh, Metro Atlanta. And we had the opportunity to partner and, and, and really grow and expose the world to the African-American HBCU, which stands for Historically Black College and University Experience. So we, we, we developed Drumline on stage as a theatrical, we toured about 60 cities throughout the United States. And then we went into uh, Korea. And then we went into Japan and Tokyo. And that, that just really allowed us to provide a musical expression, right, from the HBCU experience and take it to the, the world scene. So you get a chance to explore culture, the history of the marching band, uh, the theatrics around that, uh, the musical intonation from, from Africa all the way through pop and hip hop, through Motown, through current. And for those who haven't experienced a homecoming or a battle of the bands, it's something new and fresh and exciting around our culture from a collegiate perspective. So we, we toured that about five or six years. And then now it goes out every two years. Every two years, we go back out into the marketplace and hit the subscription bases throughout the US. And we, we have a, a booking agency and a whole nine to really explore what that culture looks like on the global scene. So very exciting stuff. Man, that's a man. I can only imagine the, the you know, the people out in Asia hearing this type of soul, these marching bands. Like, what was the reaction and what was like the, you know, from their experience, like, you know, with the, were they just in awe? I mean, obviously they had to love it because you guys kept on going back and back and back. Yes, yes. Amazing. We're like superstars, you know. It's, it's, it's black pop, it's culture. You know, usually you see athletes, right? You see entertainers. But to see musicians, it's that same level of respect to the culture and our contribution to the world. Uh, Beating on the drums, high stepping, the show style and marching. There is a a, music crosses social economic backgrounds. It crosses language. You don't even have to have a conversation. You can enjoy a good piece of music and connect with other cultures. So it's just from that, it's a cultural exchange. It's an expression. It's received and appreciated and then reciprocated. Uh, mm-hmm. So Drumline was an amazing experience. And we still, you know, still still able to celebrate that throughout the tours that we have upcoming. Man, amazing, amazing. Sounds so awesome, man. Congratulations on that, too. <laughs> so, I Thank mean, you. the audience today is in for a treat because we're going to make another quick pivot out there from Asia yeah. to the Middle East area. We're going to discuss about international business. Now, I, like yourself, has traveled uh, uh, in, in extensive throughout the world and I've been to so many places. I always wonder, like, where can I see myself living? You know, if I want to live somewhere, yeah. could you live? It might be good to visit, but could you actually yeah. live there? You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. I myself, yeah. I can't visualize myself, you know, on a beach, just waking up and just like, you know, <laughs> in and out like that all day. Maybe not. I need a little bit more, you know, interaction and engagement. So um, you, you conducted uh, international real estate uh, uh, deals before. And um, I just wanted to ask you, you know, what were some challenges and like, what were, what were some things that you, because what I'm thinking is like, I always think about risk, you know, like risk. What is the right. risk? What is the risk? What is the right. risk? And then the risks are just amplified when you're dealing business in other countries. You know what I'm saying? Right. So, yeah. Right. So you right. want to d- d- discuss that and talk, talk about that a little bit? Well, it's, it's all about being sensitive to the culture of where you're doing business. And, and I think oftentimes, you know, there can be a level of arrogance uh, from American perspective. You want everybody to speak English. You want all currency to be in US dollars. You know, you want to do things uh, expeditiously, get in, take care of the business. But when you're doing business in other countries, you have to respect the culture. You know, when you're in China or Asia, they want to get to know you. They want to get to know your family, right? Where did you come from? What's your surname? Uh, did you learn a little bit of their culture and their language? Have a meal, have a dinner, right? Explore getting to know each other as a family first before you discuss the business, right? When, when we were in, 
Kenya, Nairobi, same thing. You know, you want to get out and see the people, get to know the culture, get to know the tribes, understand who you're dealing with before you get into discussing the business. So I always try to learn a little bit about the language, right? Hello, goodbye, how are you? Understand the culture that I'm, that I'm dealing with before we get into any type of business, whether that's touring, whether it's restaurant, whether it's real estate, you want them to know you as an individual. First and foremost, build business with integrity, right? You're not trying to go over and take advantage of the culture and exploit the resources, you know. Then you wanna be sensitive and celebrate the differences just because they don't look like you or eat like you or worship like you or the political arena is not like yours don't mean you talk down, right? You get to know and appreciate and celebrate the differences. And then you negotiate the business like art. You know, you be creative on how you can come together to solve world problems or create reciprocal respect in the transaction. And with that, you know, God willing, you have your good business success, right? By mm -hmm. respecting and appreciating the nuances of the different cultures. Wow, that's amazing. I mean, it's a lot to juggle there and unpack. I mean, but I think I think you 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 laid you laid out a good point. I mean, basically, what you're saying is establish a foundation that you can build off of before you just come in there with you know talking a million dollars a million uh, uh, <laughs> miles per hour and talking about all these ideas and the people are gonna look at right. you like no 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 we, we do it different around here and the same thing right. can be true when they come to America, you know. That's right. That's right. Is it globally? Uh, it's, it's unique because our voice and, and our, I'm speaking African-American men, you know, are missing on the global scene. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, you don't see a lot of us at world forums, you know, at social events like the World Cup or the Kentucky Derby or, you know, the, the, the sports uh, events uh, around the world. And business is done at those events. I, I was invited to the Dubai World Cup and had an opportunity to be trackside. And you could imagine the, uh, the world leaders that were there, the business community that was there, the socialites that was there, and how many people just by sharing the love for horse racing was able to conduct and connect on the business level. Uh, so, so first, we got to show up and be present in order to be invited to do business. Mm. And it's not just about uh, the housewives of Atlanta, right? Or or the NBA playoffs, you know, the, the optics of how we are viewed globally is not only what you see on TV, but what you can contribute in business, what you can contribute in academia, what you can contribute in sports and entertainment, and what you can contribute in politics. We have to change the narrative of our contribution as a people to humanity. And once that's ex 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 expanded upon and shared and connected, then the business community opens wide up. You'll be surprised the amount of business that can be done when you can connect as a human being. Mm -hmm. You speak of the World Cup, man. I'm gonna the World Cup is coming to Qatar <laughs> in Doha in December 2022. Yes. So you're gonna come on out there, man. We're gonna go see what's talk, what they're talking about, man. We're gonna go check check right, your hands, right. man. So, that's right. That's yeah, right. Yeah, that's yeah. right. But you so this is your book, right? You wrote a book and congratulations on that. Um you Thank talk you. a lot about the same things about establishing a foundation and prepare motivation, your five keys to success. Why, why did you write this book? And uh, what is it about the plight of an uh, entrepreneur? Excellence at a minimum. So, look, thank you so much, Yusuf. It, that book is uh, uh, an expression of the challenges to be an entrepreneur, right? It, anybody can go get a job and work nine to five and, and work hard for 50 years and retire and have a decent retirement. But the challenge in what, uh, especially in America and the world, there's another level of respect that comes with becoming an entrepreneur. I can look you in your eyes and say, wow, you look like you paid taxes and created jobs and had the, the, the challenges of creating something to build legacy. There's a different level of respect when you travel the world and say, I'm a business owner. I have a thousand employees, right? I'm a contributor to the global economy. There's a, there's a respect that comes with that. And, and oftentimes people see the success, but don't understand the plight. So this book is about the plight. What does it take to be successful in business in America and to be able to grow your brand to become a multinational corporation? What are the keys to success? What is money? 
how to incorporate a business. What are those challenges to have access to capital? And despite all that, what happens when you fail? What lessons are learned, right? <laughs> That's the beauty of being transparent. Everybody has the story and everybody can share both the successes and the challenges to inspire the next generation of youth and young entrepreneurs. So they can become job uh, creators, right? Successful business owners and givers back to humanity. That's what that book is all about. My own plight as an entrepreneur and how I pursue excellence at a minimum in business and life and in community. Well, I, I thank you. So uh, thank you for signing my copy and, and, the, and the audience, <laughs> I appreciate that. I, and the audience can, can, can buy this book. Is it, is it on Amazon and is it on like Barnes and Nobles as well? Or? All the digital All platforms. Yep, they can, they can DM me if they want an autographed copy. You know, we'll get it out to them any place in the world. Um, I'm literally at service to humanity. Um, excited about the, the ventures that are forthcoming. I'm not sure if you're sharing the social platforms, but you know, follow me on IG and Facebook. Reach out to me through DM. Check, take a look at our websites and our foundation. And I'd love to connect with your audience. Absolutely. Well, why don't you go ahead right now and just shout out where, where, where exactly you're at on IG and, and Facebook and all your, your social, media, uh, social media handles. Awesome, awesome, awesome. At The Supreme Burger on IG, uh, Supreme Burger US on Facebook. Um, um, the, the website is supremefoodsworldwide.com. And from there, you can see the foundation, the restaurant and the, and all the for-profit entities that we're engaged in. That's awesome. I'm just, I don't know if the audience can see this right here, but this is chapter seven. And it's ironic because <laughs> the, the subtitle to chapter seven is Thinking global. Thinking global. <laughs> <laughs> you see? That's so, right. That's inspiration, right. you know, and it comes full circle, man. It's full, it's full circle, man. Well, thank you so much for everything, man, again. And uh, I really appreciate you, um, you know, being inspiration in my life. Um, you're, you're an icon in, in, in Atlanta, so you continue to, to be so. Um, we thank you for having, having, you, having you come on the Think Global podcast. Uh, what's, what's, is there any other projects that, that you're currently working on? Well, right now, um, we're about to start a cap raise for about $5 million to expand the restaurant globally. Um, we're looking at strategic partners around the world who would like to franchise and grow with the family business. Um, I will welcome an invitation to Qatar to, to, to bring some samples over, whip up some fish and fries and uh, some Supreme burgers, do a little tasting, you know, and share so we can say we, we have the best burger in the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll whole, be, I'll, I'll be all, be, put me down right for that, man. Yeah, don't, <laughs> definitely, man. You, you should definitely, if you have the opportunity, or even if you're in the region, come on, pop over, man. Pop yes. over. Yeah, yeah. We know some people. I would, I would love contact. to. Yeah, yeah. I'd love to. Yusuf, it's my pleasure. Thank you so much for the invitation. Really excited about what you're doing with your global footprint, Think Global. And any way that I can support you, please feel free to, to reach out as always. My Thank pleasure. You, my brother. Thank you, my brother. God bless you. Yeah, take care, man. Thank you very much. Inshallah, we'll talk soon. Okay, peace.